Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Adrian Giovanco, Inspire CEO. Uh, really excited to kick off today. We're really excited to share this content with you um, and be, be part of contributing to uh, the collective knowledge that's out there in the field. Today, we're going to talk about what happens when we cut mature cannabis flowers down and take uh, the months of hard work and love we put into nurturing these plants into finished product full of the compounds patients need and consumers want. Uh, the compounds I'm talking about are cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, collectively referred to as secondary metabolites. These compounds often serve as defense mechanisms by the plant, but have been bred over centuries to bring out unique characteristics that humans find useful for medicines, flavorings, and recreational drugs. All of the parameters that are at play when the plant is photosynthesizing are still at play in the curing stage. As we'll learn about more later, curing cannabis is all about strategically managing these parameters to get the very best cannabis to market. There are common practices taught by generations of successful cultivators that are widely used at scale at work. But as science makes its mark on the industry, are there lessons to learn? Are there more efficient, less labor-intensive ways to dry and cure that, that allow us to capture more of the valuable secondary metabolites? Our exploration has opened up questions at the same time it's provided answers, and we're excited to take a closer look. The pilots of today's presentation are Inspire's CTO, Robbie Bass, and Inspire's cannabis business strategist, Jesse Porter. So what is curing cannabis? It's the process that controls against product loss and degradation to add value and brand recognition, but it's so much more. It's an art, it's a science, it's an expression, a signature, and a sign of quality. The end user wants a product that smokes clean, tastes great, and reflects the potency and effects of the genetics. The craft cultivator wants a product that reflects all the thought, passion, and hard work that went into cultivating the genetics. We see curing as a choke point and an opportunity. Controlling the curing process creates consistent results and predictable product flow. But we always wonder, do you know how much product you lost during curing? To temperature degradation? To handling? To bud rot? To light exposure? Could you put a number on it? It can have significant financial impact. And it's an aspect of cannabis production often overlooked, mismanaged, or misunderstood by entrepreneurs and cultivators alike. Appropriate curing will increase your price per pound and extraction yields. It will reduce the amount of product loss to bud rot and pathogens. Curing will increase shelf life, and importantly, curing cannabis is better medicine. The desired effects, potency, and flavor are all directly tied to the secondary metabolites produced during that flowering phase. These flavonoids, terpenes, and cannabinoids combine to create the true entourage effects that make you love a strain. And in order to protect those secondary metabolites, it's important to understand the science of what is happening when we cure cannabis. And I'll be honest, we're all trying to understand the science behind curing cannabis and we admit the research on the topic is lacking. We've spoken with molecular biologists, atmospheric physicists, chemists, research scientists, cannabis cup winners. I even talked to some guy with a particle accelerator. We talked to cheesemakers, dry age meat producers, winemakers, and culinary herb manufacturers. We pulled data from licensed cannabis producers around the US and we're doing our own research as we speak. There are still some unknowns, some variables that need to be controlled, and some tests that need to be done, but we've collected some useful data that we'd like to contribute to the discussion on curing. What we do know is that cured cannabis is more desirable and understanding the process will increase yield and produce cannabis cup winning results. So what's the difference between drying and curing? We get this question a lot. I usually say, you can dry in the oven, but you cure with care. And what I mean by that is drying is part of the curing story, but it's not the whole story. Drying cannabis is about removing enough moisture so the product can be smoked or otherwise processed. I mean, throw it in the oven at 200 degrees for an hour and it'll be dry, but it won't be enjoyable. Curing cannabis is a controlled process that protects secondary metabolites, furthers chemotype expression, 
and creates an enjoyable smoke. Curing cannabis accounts for the time and conditions required to maximize expression and preserve the product. And when it comes to talking about the best product, it's important to know when to harvest to get the most out of your efforts. This part of the process does have some art involved. As trichromes develop, they go through three distinct phases, and after the plant is harvested, the development continues for a short period of time. The trichromes develop a stem and a head that I sort of think result, resembles a mushroom. It begins clear and the head swells, matures, and becomes cloudy. Cloudy trichromes are at the peak of ripeness, and the goal is to harvest as many of them as possible. When the trichomes begin to degrade, they turn amber and signal an eminent harvest. So what's a trichome, and what's in it? Well, here's a drawing of one. It has around 30 flavonoids, 200 terpenes, and 140 cannabinoids, give or take a few. And we don't want to lose any. That bulbous mushroom head we developed in flower contains the majority of the good stuff. The secretory cells have the terpenes and the secretory vesicles have the cannabinoids. We wanna make sure that they are fully developed and protected through the entire packaging pipeline. Once harvested, the plant stops transpiring, begins respiring, and needs to be managed to protect the product. The handling of the product must be done with care in order to make sure delicate trichomes heads are not destroyed. And that brings us to factors of degradation. Handling is a factor of degradation, but as Brian mentioned earlier, all 10 cardinal parameters of plant influence impact curing. Light, humidity, temperature, CO2, airflow and atmospheric conditions, water, oxygen, microbes, nutrients, they're all at play. Understanding how each influences each other and the cannabis product during curing is an important step in the refinement of the process. First, let's talk about temperature as it drives the timeline associated with moisture removal. The hotter the ambient temperature, the faster the product dries. We know that if we dry a product too quickly, however, the result will crumble to a powder and lack appeal. One reason for this is that the temperatures above 68 degrees Fahrenheit can volatilize terpenes and degrade secondary metabolites. Temperature will also impact the speed and completion of enzymatic reactions within the plant. So raising temperatures 10 degrees will double the speed of enzymatic reactions. But when temperatures are too cold, enzymatic reactions halt. In order to uniformly cure cannabis, temperature should be consistent, and below 68 degrees at all times to drive enzymes and protect secondary metabolites. And while low temps slow pathogen development, it can also cause discoloration and susceptibility to decay. Temperature and time are a balancing act when we think about curing. Light's also a major factor in curing. We know that if light is present, plants will continue to produce chlorophyll, which is unwanted for the next phase. But light also negatively affects oils. Visible light triggers the auto-oxidation process and UV light causes photo-oxidation, both of which degrade oils, especially those monoterpenes. Monoterpenes have been shown to degrade rapidly under the presence of light and high temperatures, like in a matter of hours. So I think this is one area where fresh frozen processing is fantastic. It allows for the capture of more monoterpenes that would otherwise be lost in the curing process. Moving forward, another major influence on the curing process is humidity. Humidity is about the moisture in the room as well as in the bud. And we know buds are between 80 to 95% water weight at harvest, and most of that moisture needs to be removed. So one core concept of curing is that we migrate the moisture from the interior of the bud to the exterior of the bud. And while high moisture content facilitates pathogen growth in bud rot, studies have shown that reducing moisture content of the bud below 20% prevents microbe growth and increases shelf life. The slow and controlled progression of moisture facilitates chemical enzymatic reactions and allows the water to pull more unwanted materials from the plant but slow controlled moisture removal requires more than just some fans. 
It takes an understanding of pressures, engineering, and controlled measurement. And speaking about controlled measurement, we need to reduce the moisture content of the bud below 20%, but precision is important. The difference between 19% moisture in the bud and 14% moisture in the bud is, well, 5%, right? But that 5% of water weight could easily be worth millions of dollars at scale. Millions. Take some time to digest that. Thinking about time. When it comes to curing time, there's a balancing act between terpenes lost and the completion of the enzymatic processes. When it comes to terpenes, time is the enemy as they degrade every single day. For enzymes, time is a friend who allows for the completion of the enzymatic processes. With limited time, enzymes do a limited job in the breakdown of starches and chlorophyll, leaving the final product harsh and tasting like alfalfa. Take too long and risk the exposure to microbial outbreaks, breakdown, and degradation of secondary metabolites, which will destroy bag appeal. It takes a delicate touch to balance terpene loss and enzymatic processes needed to make for a superior consumable. Atmospheric conditions like gases in the room will influence the curing process as well. One effect of atmospheric conditions is oil oxidation, which accelerates with the concentration of dissolved oxygen and depends largely, largely on the oxygen pressures in the headspace, as well as the ambient temperatures. Oil oxidation is an undesirable series of chemical reactions involved, involving oxygen that degrades the quality of oil. Oxidation eventually produces rancidity in oil and acrimonious flavors and smells. And while all oil is in a state of oxidation, you can't stop it completely. There are ways to reduce it. Modified atmospheric packaging, MAP, MAP, is a useful system which makes it possible to regulate the composition of atmosphere in the headspace and thus control the rate of respiration. Respiration is one of the basic processes of de deterioration and it's highly influenced by the atmospheric composition of CO2, oxygen, ethylene, and water vapor. It's driven by temperature. During respiration, oxygen is consumed and CO2, ethylene, and water vapor are generated. MAP allows you to control atmospheric conditions that impact curing so you can slow down or speed up respiration and other metabolic processes. This also allows you to reduce sensitivity to ethylene, reduce the development of disorders, and inhibit pathogen development. Air exchanges in the space and the control of atmospheric conditions are imperative for the control of the curing process. However, it's important to note we need enough oxygen long enough to trigger those reactions, but we need to limit dwell time in order to protect the oils. MAP allows us to control these variables. So what in the plant makes it harsh? Chlorophylls, lipids, sugars, carbohydrates, amino acids, water, fertilizers, and heavy metals can all make the smoke harsh. When we're curing, we're essentially trying to remove or otherwise process out as much of that other stuff as possible. Our plants work hard to create this biomass and flour. Enzymes work hard to remove it afterwards. Plants create chlorophyll, which give the plant its green color and undesirable grassy flavor. Fats and sugars are also created during the growth process and become energy sources for the reactions as the plant dries and cures. But excessive nitrogen and heavy metals in the fertilizers can also impact curing and cause auto-oxidation in long-term storage. So proper plant nutrition during the flower and appropriate cultivation techniques lead to better cured product that is less susceptible to, to deterioration. Something that makes the cured product less harsh is respiration that we mentioned earlier. Respiration is the process in which organisms convert biochemical energy from stored food, like the sugars and starches from photosynthesis, into adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for ripening. During respiration, plants take oxygen from the air and give off carbon dioxide, moisture, and heat. 
the opposite of photosynthesis. And respiration continues until the stored starch and sugar reserves are depleted. Temperature dictates the speed of respiration and is the most important factor in influencing post-harvest life and quality of a given product. The oxygen in the surrounding environment is of utmost importance because it's the primary gas used during respiration. Lowering oxygen in the air allows you to lower the respiration rate, but if there's not enough oxygen, the product goes into anaerobic fermentation and will produce alcohols that impart unwanted flavors. Enzymes also play a role in respiration, and there are four enzyme groups facilitating the curing process. Proteases, amylases, lipases, and cellulases, and they all break down different stuff. These enzymes use stored plant energy to break down unwanted plant materials like proteins, nucleic acids, starches, fats, phosphate esters, and other macromolecular substances during the curing process. Eye temperature drives enzymatic reactions and affords protections against microbial growth, but high temperatures will also negatively affect secondary metabolites. Temperatures that are too high or too low will denature enzymatic activity, and that cannot be restarted. These enzymes need plant material, heat, proper pH, and moisture to activate and they need time to work, but their process creates longer chain molecules that have unique flavor and amplified effects. In the case of water, in the case of curing, water is both a preservative and a solvent. It plays a critical role as a catalyst to enzymes and is a vehicle for removing unwanted products from the bud. Hydrolysis, is a chemical reaction in which the interaction of a compound with water results in the decomposition of that compound. This process breaks down chemical polymers into simpler units, and an example of that is turning starches into sugars. Hydrolysis is one of the most important processes that improve the quality of cannabis as it cures. As water migrates out of the plant, it will remove byproducts from the breakdown caused by enzymatic activity and further the development of secondary metabolites. If water moves too quickly, there will not be enough time to effectively compete, complete the processes. If the process is too slow, you risk mold and other biological contaminations. Water activity drives microbial activity, and that's why we need to remove it for long-term storage. But in controlling water migration through the plant, we allow it to homogenize development, stimulate processes, and produce a cleaner smoke. Thinking about post-harvest diseases, curing and stored products are subject to a variety of rots and decay caused by fungi and bacteria. Some known fungi that can develop in the curing phase are Botrytis and Fusarium, and some of the bacteria are Pseudomonia and Aspergillus. These diseases can cause color change, degradation, and will certainly result in a failed microbial test. It's important to note that many infections of diseases start before harvest, and when these products are transferred to storage, infections continue to develop. So proper environmental controls, product handling, and SOPs are required to prevent post-harvest diseases. The curing space should have appropriate biological filtration in place to prevent contamination and the growth of yeast, bacteria, and molds. Sanitation and biological filtration are also important to handlers to protect products from post-harvest diseases. People carry pests. We have about 10,000 microbes on each hand, and we lose 40,000 skin cells every minute. These are things to consider in order to protect the final product. But what makes cannabis great? Turns out time is a factor in chemotype expression. The process of polymerization is magical. Studies show us that when cannabis is cured over time, we do not see an increase in the quantity of terpenes, but we see a measurable difference in terpene profile. Terpenes marry, commingle, and continue to develop and homogenize. 
The polymerization process takes what are fantastic individual terpenes and harmonizes them in a way specific to the genetics involved. It's like going from mono to stereo in flavor and effects. So we know that during the curing phase, secondary metabolites reconnect to create new compounds not present at harvest. This is when the product becomes unique and stands out in the market. I think this is also a very important aspect of medical viability as well. When my mom was sick with cancer, we tried every strain we could find and the results were inconsistent. I think the curing was inconsistent too. When cured correctly, the terpene and cannabinoid expression has fully developed and is more capable than the individual metabolites. Cured cannabis is better medicine. Curing creates a better recreational product too, but better yet, polymerization allows for the true chemovar expression of strains. If we really want to know the medical viability of each genetic, we need to make sure that we cure it appropriately in order to capture the symphony of polymerized secondary metabolites and not just a few standout notes. So how do we cons consistently achieve great results? Understanding the factors we just talked about, there are a variety of approaches that we have seen have success in the market. First is the legacy birth. This classic process has been refined for generations. It has a rich history of success. The core concept here is to harvest the plant, remove the fan leaves, hang it upside down, blast it with air until it's crispy to the touch, then bucket, put it in an airtight container, burp it, and monitor it. Many iterations of this method exist. Everyone has a different opinion on how long and how often to burp, and even how long to cure. Is it seven days, 14 days, 30 days, six months? Depends on who you ask. What we do know is that this system works, but we don't fully understand why. Even at the highest level of academia, they're studying this legacy method to better understand the science behind the results. Understanding what happens to these buds scientifically while they're in this airtight environment should prove to be a very strong breakthrough in curing cannabis science. Another method we've explored is freeze drying. And I'll admit, at first I thought it was a gimmick. But then I experienced the nose and bag appeal of products that had been freeze-dried. Stunning. Important to note that this level of freeze-dried curing is not something you do with a harvest-right survival freeze-dryer. It's a precision machine built and operated by professionals. Oversight and understanding is needed. But the core concept here is that we vacuum purge the water from the product, remove the water from the chamber, then freeze dry the product. Freeze dry is one of the best ways to halt the degradation process to protect THC and the secondary metabolites. However, this process does require delicate hands to not damage the product and a fundamental understanding of timelines to make sure that appropriate enzymatic activities can occur. We are all excited to follow the evolution of this technology and see where it leads us. Speaking of technology, I'll let our CTO take it from here and talk about how we've been refining the process of drying and curing in the same room. Rob? Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, you got it. Hi, everyone. Um, over at Inspire, when we delved into providing these environmental control systems for drying and curing, we went to the best and we went to the worst and we looked at all the different parts in between. And we came to the realization that the most specialized and effective combined drying and curing chambers on the market have the following features. They can accurately control temperature and humidity in a wide range, and they can have a substantially high airflow rate relative even to the cultivation rooms we were designing at around 20 to 30 air changes per hour. But we were still being asked to design a large scale drying room in one part of the facility and a curing room in the other. And this naturally led us to wonder, what's the point of drying in one room and then curing in another specialized device, be it a jar, a Tupperware container, or a cardboard barrel? Why can't we dry and cure cannabis in the same space? 
Now, this might end up being one of those game changer ideas that flies in the face of conventional wisdom. Jesse was just describing that conventional technique earlier. The drying step and the curing step, they happen in two different rooms. While this is a tried and true approach, it brings with it this extra incurred cost of labor, equipment, and real estate. And also, you have a risk of damaging the product in the transfer from one spot to the other. You know, why take up two different areas in a facility anyways for drying and then curing, if instead it could be done quickly and in the same space? Why not use that freed up floor area for like bigger and better things? I don't know, you know, growing more plants. So if you want to design a dry cure room and handle this in one fell swoop, let's talk about some of the ideas that might serve you well. The first place to start is with confidence that you've got consistent airflow around the product in the room you're trying to cure. We consider this to be a task for the CFD modeling software we employ, and it's a good way for us to provide a strong validation to our curing room physical layout suggestions. You're also gonna to wanna to have a strategy. For moisture removal over time, you wanna understand whether it's gonna be a 10-day linear drying rate with the same amount of moisture removed each and every day, or some other strategy, but this is going to form the basis for your equipment selections. Now, if you want to take it to the next level, you'll want to start talking about what those actual set points in the room are going to be. You'll probably want to target a specific temperature for product quality maintenance and a humidity level that allows you to realize the strategy you came up with on the previous slide. To maintain the balance of that highest level of terpene retention, a reasonable curing and polymerization rate, and a satisfactory level of enzymatic activity, then that temperature is probably gonna be around 65 degrees Fahrenheit and a humidity anywhere from 50 to 65%. Now, the most advanced way to approach this task is to automate the whole thing. It is possible to field feedback moisture removal from the product back into your humidity control schema. So we've seen a number of systems do this, but the most accurate way seems to be tracking the weight of the product through time in the curing room. And the best data we have tells us that the rate of moisture removal changes over time at a given temperature and humidity set point in the space. But if instead of fixing your temperature and humidity, let's say we just fix the temperature, we could manipulate the space humidity to change the vapor pressure on the moisture content of the plants. And this directly controls the rate of drying. Now again, manipulating the room vapor levels controls the moisture removal and gives you the ability to slow down or increase moisture loss over time, allowing for the polymerization and curing to happen at the same time as the drying step. This is the best way to achieve a hands-off approach to the curing process and also deliver consistency through benchmarking from batch to batch. We don't expect curing strategies to be fixed over time, and neither should you. Even the differences in bud structure of different crop genetics will be influential in determining a signature curing methodology that you can attach to your product. Flexibility in the conditions you can maintain might be even more important in this regard. So as you get into the actual room design, keep the following ideas in mind. First, if you're going to turn your room into a big curing jar, you really need to think about sealing your room. Tight construction and sealed concrete floors are some of those considerations. This is gonna prevent gases from getting into and out of the room without your control. To that end, you'll probably wanna break the seal every once in a while. You should consider a mechanism to ventilate or burp the room, just like you would in a jar. To do this effectively, you'll need a way to bring atmospheric air into the space to dilute the buildup of gases. And be sure you've got at least MERV-13 filters on this mechanism. On the room exhaust, be a good neighbor and consider an odor remediation system so that you're not exhausting air that other people in the neighborhood might find offensive when you release it into the atmosphere. Lastly, consider a sensor array for determining when and how often you'd like to ventilate or burp the room. Sensing systems for ethylene are readily available, as well as for CO2. As we heard from Jesse, these gases provide real indications of the stage of curing you've achieved. Monitoring them will help you hone your curing strategy. And in the future, I think we'll see electronic monitoring of other specific gases, so make sure you've got a system flexible enough to incorporate what might be coming. By way of example, we're finding out that the pathogens we're trying to avoid in the rooms actually generate gases that usually can't be detected by humans with the background of all the other smells that are in there. Currently, 
Pleuroanisoles and thiols are compounds of interest. And we're as curious as you are to see what ours and others' research leads us to in the study of the gas sensing arena. Hey, Jeff, you there? Absolutely, Rob. Great job. All right, buddy. Back to you to wrap up this puppy. Got it. <laughs> and that sort of brings us to the end of our presentation. I wanted to take a moment to say that I really think we're all in this together, sharing knowledge and going down the path of education is only going to improve the curing process. But even when we have enough data to talk objectively, there's going to be an artistic touch that sets many people apart, a signature that's a byproduct of experience and feel. And we just hope that this webinar gives you some information you need to refine your signature and paint your masterpiece. So thanks again for joining us today. Please give us a few minutes to organize the questions from the audience and for me to get a few sips of tea. And then we'll uh, jump into the Q&A here. The first question um, is, can you achieve decarboxylation through curing? And it may, it may uh, be worthwhile to quickly explain what de decarboxylation means. Sure. So decarboxylation is essentially the process that cannabis goes through to become psychoactive. Uh, Traditionally, we associate that with heat, a uh, certain heat requirement that changes the polymers that allows them to be more psychoactive. So that product then can be used directly to manufacture edibles or even consume directly to still get the effects, whereas fresh bud that's not decarboxylated won't get you that psychoactive uh, effects. I think an interesting note here is something we're still discovering. Allison Justice and Outco did a study on curing uh, hemp and cannabis. And what they found was that in, over the process of a 30 day cure, um, right around day 30, they actually achieved decarboxylation, uh, which is a dramatic breakthrough um, because that's not something that's been proven to be achieved through the curing process in the past. I wonder what the elements involved are. You know, it's important to understand the parameters and the conditions, the heat that was in fact in impacting that, that shared isolated space, but also the pressures and the gases. Uh, there are a lot of things going on in that airtight space that could actually contribute to uh, decarboxylation. Um, I think pH is another one too. But anyway, there's a handful of things in there that could that could affect decarboxylation and actually make it happen. And now it's been proven on paper. So I think it's something we need to explore more. Um, but it's an interesting note that we've actually seen through a study that it can be done. I love it. T terpene rich, psychoactive, raw cannabis. <laughs> something new that, to chew on. Uh, that could be pretty cool. Um, cool. All right. No pun intended. One application for it. <laughs> yeah. uh, another question coming in here. Uh, at what point is it no longer considered drying but curing? Sure. For me, you know, drying is a fundamental aspect of the curing process. But when you harvest the product, you immediately make a decision on whether or not you're going to dry it or cure it. And what I mean by that is that drying is a route where you just try and add heat to remove moisture. And that's only one small component of the curing process that must account for all the other things that are happening. So you can dry without curing, but you cannot cure without drying, if that makes sense. That's sort of my perspective on it. Um, I know we have some differential opinions there, but uh, my feeling is that appropriate curing will involve drying, whereas you can dry any way, shape, or form. And the curing process starts immediately upon harvest. It's the decisions you make from that point moving forward that allow for this you know, progression and polymerization to happen. So, you know, the, the conversations Jesse and I, I have on this are long and uh, usually go right into the night. Um, I, I'm convinced that, you know, the, the drying, je through Jesse's persuasion, I'm convinced that the drying and curing can happen in, in one um, short period of time. Traditionally, we see all sorts of things being asked of us. Design a drying room here. We're going to leave it in there for 10 days, and then we're going to design a curing room over here, put the things into jars or whatever containers, and move it into a curing room in its own conditions, and let it cure in that 
in that area. That's usually also a seven to 10 day process. And then it goes into bags and we see the continuation of curing when we've got MAP systems involved in the storage of the product over time. Um, like I said, Jesse's convinced me we can do otherwise. And we've started to see the data come back that yes, you can do drying and curing and polymerization control, curing control. Uh, this can all be done in, in one area, but in the room that you're doing it in, you have to be able to control different levels of gases, whether it's the water content of the air, whether it's the content of ethylene in the air, whether it's the content of CO2 in the air, you have to be able to independently control some of those variables and that becomes a challenge, especially at scale in a large room. Uh, we're looking at those designs right now. We're doing our own tests and I can't wait for part two of this webinar. We can come out and kind of reveal some of the data that we've got. Awesome. When do you know when curing is finished? That's a great good? question. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a subjective aspect of interpreting that product. If you like to sort of listen to that new book by Max Montrose and, and his ethos on how you determine whether or not cannabis is good or bad or the level of it, I think there's some interesting touch points in there that really give us an idea on how we judge cannabis. But let's be honest, there's two factors, right? There's the test results and then there's the customer experience and sell through numbers. And both of those things sort of need to line up um, and, and justify that higher price point. That's how we tie it back to, oh yeah, we're going to get those numbers and we're going to achieve cleaner smoke and we're going to get better sell through numbers and better brand recognition through curing. It's a there's no better answer, Jesse. Like, like there's no better way to do it. I mean, we measure all sorts of things in terms of product quality and, and the KPIs are like, you know, grams per square foot or whatever. But the fact is it comes down to bag appeal and it comes down to, does it move through the stores? You know, if it's going towards the smoking process, people have got to see it smoke it, want it. It's almost as much brand and marketing as it is the actual physical curing of it, right? So yeah, great point, Rob. It, something I want to add to that too is that there, there's an ideal time or uh, product that we want to get, but it's important to understand the market pressures. Maybe this doesn't quite apply to the six plant grower or the craft consumer that's growing cannabis for themselves. But a lot of times I think, Rob, you can back me up here. When we have conversations at scale on curing, there's a timeline that doesn't necessarily correlate to the curing process that needs to be met. And that's a timeline to get products into a space, out of a space, and onto the shelf. And I think the more that we master that process at the high commercial level, the more we'll see high quality products come out of those commercial facilities on a consistent basis. What's happening now, I think, uh, just an opinion here, is that there's a race to market, there's a need of product in the market, and that sort of demands that these products get pushed to market more quickly. It's about getting them out of the room in seven days, burping them in three, bagging them and moving them, rather than fundamentally understanding how we're going to get 2% more THC, 1% more terpene, and more flavonoid expression. So for me, there's a pressure that goes on there too that needs to be considered because it's a real market pressure. Um, so we need to work within these certain frameworks. So a lot of times, when is it ready is a matter of when can I get my money? And that limits some of the data that we've been able to collect. As we pursue more can of sewer products, we see that, yeah, that curing process takes a little bit longer. Um, the product has better shelf life and gets more money at the end. That's a long-winded and maybe didn't perfectly answer the question, but there's a little bit of insight there, I think. Well, I think we can also uh, use this topic to address Alexander's question, which is having separate rooms for dry cure has been used to support perpetual grows. Can you address this? Well, the reason that a separate room for drying and curing have been used for perpetual grows is because I've got two weeks in between harvests and I have, you know, a drying room and a curing room. And if I do anything to throw off the balance of my harvest, I've got to be able to move product through my facility. I think where we're going with this is to advance the state of the art, why aren't we drying and curing in seven days? You know, Jesse just mentioned seven day dry, three day cure, three day bag, that kind of thing. We're trying to compress the drying and curing process by manipulating variables and minimize the infrastructure and facility you need to take care of this process. That's gonna be the next step. And this is where we're trying to push this. 
Um, if we're just going to be talking about having a separate room for drying and a separate room for curing, sure, you can go down any any path you want to achieve the net effect. But at the end of the day, you're um, you know you will be better served if you can um, if you can hone these hone these processes and really optimize the system that you're working with. Yeah, great. Thanks very much. And I would encourage everybody that's more interested in some of the financial impacts that this can have, um, go to go to the revenue calculator and, and play with some of those variables and see what uh, how, how much how much uh, revenue or, or drop in operating costs you might be able to achieve by by getting more dollar per pound on on better cured cannabis, uh, lower lower or lowering your operating costs. Um, and on top of that, like if you have any more questions about curing and you want to take a deeper dive, you know, reach out to Rob and I, you know, maybe we won't talk to you until two in the morning, like we talk to each other, but we'll definitely get back to you. And we'd love to hear questions and contributions from the community. So. Great. Thanks for that. Um, another question has come in. Do you have recommended temperature and humidity conditions for storing cannabis after it's been dried and cured? Yeah, we've we've been asked that question quite a bit. So after after it's been dried and cured, um, you know, I think you mentioned Jesse mapped, and that's that's a really good way to maintain the quality and the environmental control of a product in one specific aspect, which is moisture control in the container in which you're storing it. Um, I think those things there are secondary gases that are also being controlled, you know, their levels being controlled. That um, you know, I don't know enough about map systems, but um, they seem to do a very good job, and I mean, Jesse, you tell me, is that the typical way to do things on the market today? And maybe yeah, you can I mean, touch on nitrogen flush and, and what that's all about. Yeah, I mean, oh, that, that brings up a whole other ball of wax, but I think for the most part, <clears throat> you know, we, we know the, the cardinal factors that influence the plant and cause degradation. And once that process, the enzymatic process is halted and we've removed enough moisture, it's really sort of about light and temperature. So putting it in a container where light doesn't penetrate and temperature doesn't have a direct impact will be beneficial. And I think we've seen a lot of people look to commercial agriculture and commercial packaging for solutions here, uh, which is why we tend to have a lot of conversations about nitrogen purging, essentially bringing in into gas, into a controlled space like a 55 gallon drum, which will essentially displace the oxygen so that oxidation process won't continue. Um, the idea is that now that will hold in that state for a long period of time and it can be shipped overseas or wherever it needs to go or just held on site to appropriate processing time. The issues we see with that are that um, we're not exactly sure if there's a degradation associated with that nitrogen gas, but what we do know is that in these holding cells, these 55 gallon drums, let's call them for conversation, um, usually they're done in metal drums for good long-term holding. For safety, those drums are lined, and as those drums are impacted by atmospheric conditions and temperature, the terpenes sweat and get absorbed by the liner. So now in a long-term holding environment, you have to smoke the drum to get high. That tends to not have a lot of market viability. So um, that's one of the situations we've seen come with long-term holding and nitrogen purging in large spaces, especially metal drums that are lined. Um, but really it's about, you know, halting that oxidation process and if you can stop photo oxidation and auto oxidation by preventing light penetration that's a huge first step secondarily if we can continue to control the temperature we'll have much less volatilization and and evaporation of those uh, secondary metabolites i think there's a the correlation here between or a corollary between weed and wine right um if you want to hold on to wine for a long period of time you put it in an opaque bottle you use a Corvin to seal the thing with nitrogen on top so that after you've opened it, you purge that oxygen out, you prevent, prevent oxygenation, and you store the thing in a cool place. I think the same thing applies to weed here if you're trying to maintain those, those same flavor profiles in weed. That's a good point. Let's see. Let's, let's move on to, to a question about uh, the, the mechanical side of things. Um, how do you determine the mechanical needs for a drying room? There, there's been several questions um, similar to this. Um, yeah, this is a good one too because I see Nadia 
And uh, Natty's asked a question about, you know, moisture removal in the first 24 or 48 hours, that kind of thing. It's him to Andy. Um, I, I want to start off by saying that every, every traditional drying room we go into, they, the impression is they want, the people who are doing the drying will want to remove the most amount of moisture in the first 24 or 48 hours. They're going to remove 40 to 50% of the moisture in the first 48 hours. Um, I think there's, there's two things here. I think people are seeing that their rooms are under-designed and as such, they can't maintain a temperature and humidity anyways. They, they set the set points on the thermostat and the humidistat, but they end up losing control because they don't have enough moisture removal capacity, which means that if they don't have independent temperature and humidity control, the humidity levels go way out of whack and then the temperature control goes with it. It's one thing to say you want to remove most of the moisture in the first 24 or 48 hours. I don't think that's a necessary step. I think if you can control temperature and humidity, you can do a very linear moisture removal over time, and that's going to lead to a consistent moisture profile inside and through the bud. So that's what we're trying to go for here. We're trying to avoid pockets of wet product inside the bud that can lead to the pathogen expression, or sorry, the pathogen buildup that we're trying to avoid in the first place to maintain product quality. So, you know, how do we, how do we size these systems? You have to go back to what does the grower really want to do or what does the harvester processor really want to do with the product? Are they going to, if they had their way, could they control the product quality over time by doing a very linear moisture removal? The same amount of water take, gets taken out of the plant every single day in the seven day, 10 day, three day drying period. Well, that comes with sensing, it comes with control, it comes with sizing correctly. Um, we do have our own product input sheets that we can talk, you know, we can have you fill out um, and then talk about the process after that. It's, you know, it's, it's a matter of understanding that influence of temperature and humidity on product weight over time. Jess, do you have any comments about that linear, linear drying graph? Yeah, I, 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 I think it sort, of, it sort of speaks to a couple of different processes that cost a lot of energy to restart once they or, or re-energize once they slow down what i mean by that is that when you have you know a big spike in moisture removal it's usually associated with a spike in in elevated temperature um which can have debilitating effects effects on those secondary metabolites but um what it, I, what i think it really comes down to is you know precision control and putting this wet weight in there and knowing how much you're going to remove over the course of time um, allows you to sort of game plan for how long it's going to take with the appropriate temperature and humidity set points. The spikes in temperature and humidity, um, either too high or too low, you know, do things to enzymatic processes. So if you speed up the enzymatic process early on, and then you denature the process later, you're not going to have completion of enzymatic processes. So that linear line that Rob talks about is really sort of the concept of curing. We have water pressure that pushes the oils to the outside. We have the enzymatic process, which is fundamentally driven by water and temperature. And if we have spikes, we can have enzymes just sort of, you know, go crazy and then die off. We need them to all sort of work together with enough time in the appropriate environment to break down the things they need to break down. We've seen this technique applied um, with a little bit higher temperatures to remove a lot of moisture. And inevitably the smoke is a little bit more harsh and tends to test a little bit lower on the THC and terpene scale relative to the biomass that's there. There's still stuff remaining in the bud that compromises that test result. So although it's a, it's a wonderful conversation, especially talking about retarding microbe growth and getting down to that 20%, but if we do it in a linear fashion that doesn't allow moisture to be reconsumed by the, by the cannabis, then we know that we are moving to a finish line and not moving in a circle, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, to, to your to your point about curing being an art as well as a science, I have a feeling you, you probably have some specific uh, methods in, in your sleeve to, to 
bring bring a fantastic finished product to market that uh, involve different different set points along the way. But maybe that's you know that's thing. loaded, Brian. You've been a part of these conversations where I've been screaming and yelling about five different ways that I think are great to do it and win a cannabis cup and. And then, you know, we talk about whether or not those are possible and the real science involved. So, yeah, absolutely. We're still in the mode of discovery. The proof is in the pudding. Really good weed is really good weed. It's undeniable. I think interpreting is a big factor here and really determining what good weed is. But the market will tell you price point, use, use uh, sell through numbers and brand recognition are a big factor because they're tied directly back to the product you produce. Uh, well, word has it you've won a cannabis cup in your day. Maybe uh, back in my day, I may have won many others with genetics that I bred that I didn't actually compete with too. So it's a it's a fun game to be a part of. All right, very cool. Um, got another question here about terpenes. Uh, what percent terpenes would you call high terpene content? Man, it's interesting, you know, because we see a lot of different test results, but you know. I think I saw some granddaddy purple test at like 4% one time, which is sort of a, a real high mind blowing number and you know, somewhere around 2% as far as a mass mass co collection of terpenes usually is pretty good. But again, I think that the quantity of terpenes, although very important and measurable, the symphony that's created through polymerization has been shown to uh, just be more medically effective or more psychoactively viable for recreational products. The quantity of terpenes is important, but more important is the quality of each terpene. As I talked about the trichrome heads, they need to remain intact because they have the secretory cells and the secretory vesicles um, that contain cannabinoids and terpenes. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all important in there. Um, but yeah, I, I think that uh, I think there's a lot of ways to get it done, and I think that we're yeah. we're just sort of trying to figure it out. No, that's a good point. I, I think when you're when you're testing terpenes, you get just a, a overall an overall percentage, but you don't get um, may not always get the full the full profile or, or spectrum. So it's quantity and all, yeah. but also quality. Yeah, maybe we should think about having a conversation about why we should talk about spectrum and cannabinoid profile in the same vein that we talk about 40% THC test results and 4% terpene results, you know? What about that cacophony? What if I'm way more high off a bud to test at 18% than 28%? It's happened. I've been there. Was it bud to bud variability or was it the polymerization process that made me so much happier at 18%? Uh, a lot of considerations there and subjective as well. Got it. Yeah, it makes good sense. Uh, a lot of implications for, for therapeutic uses and medicinal uses as well. Absolutely. Um, all right. Hey, let, let's shift gears back to the mechanical side. Um, do you have recommended specific airflow velocities for curing? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> the, I, I do. That's a short Lots answer. of velocity. Tons Lots of velocity. Of velocity. <laughs> So <laughs> we've seen we've seen some data for different herbs that dry out and, and even cannabis we've started to see the numbers that if you're maintaining consistent temperatures and humidities it's the condition of the air that matters more than the velocity of the air so to that end it's important that you get the conditioned air to the to the product that you're trying to cure and dry but it's the quality and quantity rather of humidity in the air, the temperature of the air, that's going to affect the drying out process. So just make sure you have airflow. The, it doesn't matter if you go faster, so this is what the data showed us. If you have way too much air, that's not a bad thing. If you have way too little, that's a very bad thing. Just get enough air to the product so that you can homogenize the atmosphere inside the room and not develop pockets of moisture retention inside the bud. I think, uh, you know, something that we're still exploring here too, and I think Rob and I have seen a little bit of differential data here is that you're really not going to blow the trichromes off the plant with air velocity. It's just something I want to bring up here that you don't worry about applying so much air that you think the trichromes are going to volatize or blow away. That, that mechanical process isn't what's causing the evaporation of trichromes. So 
just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, if anyone knows sure. me, they know it's just a blast it with air. That's my move. Right. Okay, great. Um, some some questions coming in about um, different different molecules in the air. Maybe we can um, can combine a couple here, but. Um, Question from Noah: uh, Is there any benefit to drying or curing in a more inert environment to limit exposure to O2, like an argon or CO2 atmosphere? Would this inhibit enzymatic activity? And and maybe we can also uh, address the concept of ethylene. Yeah, I think um, great question, great question, Noah. And I think that you know one of the reasons we talk so much about MAP is that we know the importance of these environmental conditions and that they need to be controlled. And I think you nailed it. You alluded to it, right? The lack of oxygen in the space or not enough oxygen in the space is going to slow down respiration, prevent enzymatic activity, and could lead to anaerobic fermentation. So it's important to control that environment um, but it's also important to know what's in the air because there's an amount of oxygen that's probably accept acceptable that doesn't have a huge negative impact that still facilitates the process. Um, Might even be necessary for the process, right? I do believe it is necessary, although there's oxygen within the plant and the cell tissues. I think that oxygen in the environment is also of critical importance and studies show that. Um, I'm scared to get too far down the road of ethylene because it's such a fun topic for me to think about. Um, my experience in growing cannabis, you know, is, is more than 15 years now. And when I first started growing after I graduated from Cal, I found that the knowledge was legacy authors and tomato studies. So white papers on tomatoes and books by guys like Ed Rosenthal and, you know, forefathers of the industry. And that information, you know, uh, it, it was in its infancy. Um, we've come a long way since then. And I laugh because I rarely think about tomatoes anymore when I cultivate cannabis. But when this ethylene conversation comes up, I can't help myself. You know, in commercial tomato production, we know that ethylene is a popular solution to packaging and creating deliverables. You know, ethylene is a hormone and they usually deliver it as an external gas. Um, if you don't know, you know, tomatoes are picked green and then basically gassed before sale in order to change the color, change the texture, and change the flavor, further development of this product and give it more market share and value. So my question always sort of comes down to, well, in tomato production, it's 100 to 150 ppm of ethylene over the course of a 24 to 48 hour period with high humidity levels, 85% you know, or so. And that triggers that enzymatic reaction, chemical reaction within the tomato to make it a better product. So as I go further down this path, uh, I'm intent on studying the effects of ethylene, the buildup of ethylene in the space, specifically in airtight environments under pressure. Um, I think it can have a dramatic influence. Uh, I want to say that we're still exploring it, although it is a very popular approach in commercial agriculture. So there's a lot of quote unquote tomato data to look at. We just don't have anything on cannabis yet. But also on a side note, you know, we've talked to facilities um, and this is third party data that we've collected just from conversation, but have, have expressed concern for ethylene leaks in their facilities or greenhouses um, because they've had situations where they've tested high levels of ethylene higher than normal and their entire harvest, um, you know, will be two weeks early with cloudy to amber trichromes, two weeks before they expect Stunted. And the incentive growth, yeah, right? And lack of biomass, lack of development, nightmare in harvesting because now you're pulling down every single bay rather than a week by week staggered approach. Um, so we know ethylene has an impact on cannabis. We're still trying to figure out how it impacts the curing process. We know it's a byproduct but we don't know the effects of the PPMs and pressures associated with that. So we're still sort of exploring that, um, if that makes a little sense. Terrific, terrific. Natty has made a comment here about greenhouse tomatoes being picked vine ripened, of course, because everything's better in a greenhouse. Uh, it is. And, and vine ripened tomatoes are better, in this opinion. Amen. 
in yeah. a, as a guy who has tomatoes in his backyard, I will preach, let the tomato ripen on the vine. It has more access to sugars and products to develop. It's going to be better. What I'm bringing up here is just simply the market pressures of producing tomatoes at scale, which are now starting to impact cannabis production as well. And I think it's important to look at some of those. Sure, let's have the craft grower that, you know, cures for 60 days and gets a better product without any ethylene and complete control. I think that would be a superior product, but market factors might not allow that to happen. So we might need to look for appropriate organic natural elements to help us influence that product and make it a better product for final, final use. That's, that's sort of, I, I totally understand what Nadia is saying. She's absolutely right. Um, I'm just saying that there's, there's a differential application here that might be applied to someone in a certain level of scale with a certain style of, of cultivation and distribution. Hopefully that helps answer the question. Um, a couple more um, on the mechanical side. Um, in your opinion, are steam humidifi humidifiers a requirement for a dry room? And then are you recommending HEPA filtration on supply side to protect plants? Are steam humidifiers? Is that, yeah, what, steam is that what you said? Yeah, are steam humidifiers a requirement for a dry room? Yeah, I would say absolutely not. Unless you're doing this in a desert and you've ended up over drying your product and you need to get moisture back in. But even then, you could still be able to it. just – still don't do it, right? I, I would definitely not use a steam humidifier. Um, you might as well use a, you know, uh, adiabatic cooler inside your space to do that same – get the same effect and then – yeah, I, I don't know. You know, if you're trying to rehydrate your product, you might run into a challenge. If you have the right mechanical equipment, you don't have to worry about going below the dew point in the room and then over drying your product because you've got the right systems in place to make it all work. At the end of the day, there, there are going to be systems that are fighting each other. You should have enough water in the product itself and not have to take so much of it out that you have to put some back in, which just conflates the whole project, the whole process. Um, and in terms of HEPA filtration, I'm not sure that HEPA filtration is necessarily a great idea. I mean, HEPA filters are so good. They're going to take out some of those VOCs out of the air as well as the particulate you're trying to avoid. But the pathogens we're worried about are generally captured with a really good MERV-13 filter that hasn't been come, become gummed up and um, you know, started letting more particles through because it's blown out because the filter hasn't been changed. So. Just use a really good MERV 13 filter and avoid the extra energy penalty and first cost and ongoing cost of replacing those HEPA filters, which is somewhat onerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, what, what kind of diffusers would you recommend for a combination dry and cure room? Any, any thoughts there? Yeah, I'd say that any diffusers that get air moving through the room will work. Um, again, we don't, you know, we can make recommendations on that, but at the end of the day, we'd like to model every room that we're in because, uh, unless, you know, I can make a recommendation, but if I can't actually see it happen, you know, with a smoke test or with a CFD model, I don't really trust it. Uh, seeing is believing for me. So we've just seen a lot of, a lot of rooms get designed with the best of intentions and then not work out so well. And we like to, we like to think about that before we start making recommendations. One of the things I've seen that you know, I, I thought was a great idea, counterintuitively ended up not being a great idea, was those linear type diffusers on one wall supplying air and then um, a return grill basically making up the other wall and you have this like very linear airflow through the room. Well, that sounds like a great idea because you have good laminar flow through the entire space. The question becomes, where do you put the temperature and humidity sensor for that space? As you go through the room, that air quality will change as it either picks up um, or in other ways changes, the air quality changes as it goes past the product. So it's a very tough thing to, for me to recommend using one of those type systems. I prefer a room that mixes well. I want a room that's mixing the air constantly so I have a homogenous atmosphere around all of the product that's inside that room as opposed to doing that linear airflow across it where I only know based on my sensors and humidities 
uh, my temperature and humidity sensors, I only know the temperature and humidity and can control to one spot in the room essentially. So mixing is better. Lots of sensors in a mix, well-mixed environment will give you a pretty good idea if you've got the mixing you need and it helps you achieve that homogenous environment. Hope that answers the question. No, that's great. That's great. I think um, I think you, you, you took that one over over and above. Thank you. Um, what is the ideal moisture content and water activity for a final product? To each of their own. Uh, well, which, no, yeah. which coast are you on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, the the idea is though, and I think this has been proven in a couple of studies, is that. You know, we have to reduce that water activity. We have to get the moisture content of the bud below 20%. Otherwise, there'll be enough energy and activity to stimulate microbial growth and pathogens and bud rot and, and all that stuff that's going on. Um, so there are some thresholds that we need to abide by. But, you know, I think this is a great point, right? I'd mentioned that the, the difference between, you know, 5% water weight's worth millions, but also that water weight might lead to a product that's not as well received in the marketplace. That additional water weight is going to have lower test results for THC and terpenes. So these are all factors of consideration that need to be taken into account. Although you might be able to capture more money weight by selling that water, people are not gonna appreciate it as much as a smoke that burns cleaner, uh, burns easier, and doesn't have those those remnants in there. I think that this is a big portion where you get to sort of define your signature. It's about timeline. It's about balancing of terpene loss and enzymatic activity. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of about how much water content do you want to leave in that product. If you're at 20%, the likelihood of winning a cannabis cup is low. The product won't smoke well in a joint or the traditional te testing methodologies. And when vaporized, there are other flavors that you might pick up from that water vapor. Whereas a lower product around 10%, you know, uh, moisture in the, in the, in the cannabis bud is much more likely to be received as a premium product. Um, so again, it's a signature balancing act and, and market pressure aspect where you have to understand, you know, how much it's worth to get better test results and better product relative to product weight and biomass. Awesome. Uh, another one related to humidity, relative humidity. What, what effect is raising the relative humidity? Um, temperature remains constant on trichomes and terpenes late in the cure to prevent over drying. So, think, yeah, go for it, Rob. Go for it. All right. I think we'll get two different, maybe two different opinions here. Um, the vapor pressure of a particular gas is independent of other gases. So if you're worried about moisture content inside your plant, you can decrease the vapor pressure by increasing the humidity in the room. So if all you're doing is hoping to get a moisture content reading that is consistent at the end of the drying and you don't over dry, you need to raise the relative humidity inside your space to keep the moisture in the plant and keep the pressure off the liquid water in the product from evaporating into the air. Um, this is something that I need to see testing on, and, and this is part of what we're doing here at Inspire. I need to see that if I increase the terpene, um, the terpenes in the air, that it also applies the same vapor pressure back to the terpenes that are on the plant that we're trying not to volatize. So, volatilize. So, uh, at, if you think, the question is strictly on what is the effect on terpenes and THC inside the plant, I don't have a very good answer. If the question is what's its effect on moisture content of the product, the huge, huge effect. Increase the relative humidity to decrease the vapor pressure on the water, keep the water in the plant. Do not put yourself in a position where it says high humidity and completely unchecked that you have this pathogen buildup that you can't control. So balancing and, and to, plates. I, I totally agree with you rob and i just sort of want to add a you know a historical side note that i think a lot of people that cure in the small batch jar philosophy um 
you know, we, we all prize that jar because we know something magical happens in there. And one conversation is about the, the relative moisture in that space, right? The humidity in that space rising up through respiration, evapotranspiration in that product, which actually might have an influence. The only reason I sort of bring that up is that I know that high humidities, certain gases are going to change and have different atmospheric, you know, they're, they're going to impact the bud differently. And that also high humidity is going to, uh, you know, dramatically change the, you know, effects of ethylene or the effects of oxygen. So uh, there's a lot of variables there that really need to be controlled. And that's what I was glad you nailed on. It, it's about precision control and understanding um, rather than, you know, just a, a, a simple, hey, this is, this is the number and this is how you get there. You know, it's sort of about understanding all those influences and impacts that go into that process and, and monitoring them and measuring them throughout the entire, entire curing. Great. Thoughts on HVL, HVLS ceiling fans, high volume, low speed ceiling fans in the dry cure space? Sure. Um, what does the model tell you, right? If you can, if you can put it into a, if you can put it into a room and show that, look, I've got good air velocity and good air mixing around the product. Great. Uh, there's a question in here that I saw about, you know, how do you get air mixing when you have all these tight baker's trays and you know hanging racks and all that other stuff? That's what I'd be worried about. If I've got air just coming from one direction and I'm <clears throat> counting on a somewhat linear laminar airflow off of this. Um, off of the fan, pushing down constantly on the product, is the air going to make it into each and every tray that I'm drying product on? I don't know the answer to that. So I need to see it borne out. Show me a CFD model. Show me something, uh, smoke test in a room that tells me it works. And if that's the case, get after it. I think there might be better ways to handle that, though. I think those high, um, I think, I think that those fans are interesting, but they are a huge surface to clean if you're not going to use some sort of aerosolized cleaning solution or, or system in between your drying and curing stages. So that's a factor to keep in mind. Yeah, I got it. Makes sense. Um, we have some uh, some questions coming in about freeze drying and, and the, the cryo cryogenic Curing, you know, Jesse, maybe you can just address a little bit more uh, your thoughts on on freeze drying cannabis versus versus a longer cure. Sure. No, I think that uh, you know it's a technology that's you know not in its infancy, but it's it's still in its early application stages for cannabis. And um, you know, I'm lucky enough to know the guys over there at CryoCure, and they've been a great resource for me in just sort of understanding, you know, what they're doing and how they're doing it, and and the you know the obstacles and pinch points and how they're getting better. I think for the most part, you know, I really like the idea of processing and curing as quickly as possible, knowing that the monoterpenes are going to disappear within you know hours, and that the other terpenes and secondary metabolites will you know, basically degrade on a day by day basis. So for me, I'm excited about a process that can get us to the finish line quicker um, while still producing a premium product. And I'll be honest, you know, like the products I've seen from freeze drying have incredible bag appeal and some of the best nose that I've ever experienced. My, my question is, is that the quality of smoke doesn't lie just in those two things. It lies in the cleanliness of the burn. It lies in the test results. It relies in the usability. And that's where we're still trying to refine the freeze drying process. When it comes to vacuum purging water in that environment, we're just not sure if it's a 12 hour period or a 48 hour period. I'm sure if you give the guys at Cryo Cure a call, they'll actually talk to you about the options and paths that they've gone down with exploration. They have some incredible scientists on staff doing discovery and research and refinement. But that's the idea is that we don't exactly know how long we're going to vacuum purge the product. That's important because once we freeze dry, we denature everything. We stop 
the degradation, we stop the enzymatic processes, things, it's a hard handbrake. So we need to make sure we're at a point in that vacuum purging process where the enzymes have broken down the other unwanted stuff and the hydrolysis has occurred to remove those products from the bud that allow us to, to freeze dry it at the right moment. That's one of the real artistic aspects of freeze drying is that making sure that the product's going to be clean after you freeze dry it because there's no going back, re-energizing the enzymes and restarting that process. It's great in that sense and it's terrifying in that sense. I think there's, there's applications for sure uh, for this product as the technology grows, um, but it will take a mastery of understanding what's going on in that vacuum purging pro uh, process, the effects of pressures, you know, and, and, and basically really close, concise monitoring. This one's related to, to more of the, the, the chemistry in the air. Um, are there any technologies to monitor the chemistry continuously during the curing process? None that I know of. I think there's some work being done on um, visual um, photographic evidence-based curing. I think that when we get further down the line with the testing, we'll realize that we can use certain gases as a certain gases as a um, corollary to the curing process. So, for example. When we monitor CO2 in a room that's for general commercial occupancy, we don't actually care about the CO2 level. We're using it as a surrogate to tell us how many people are inside the space. But I think there's going to be some gas we can measure as a surrogate that tells us, hey, you're this far along in the curing process. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Otherwise, I don't really know of those you know, two different methods that I just mentioned, a way to do that in situ you know, as, it's, as it's happening. Jesse, do you have any? Ideas here. Uh, I was I was going to sort of take it a different vein and just you know uh, there's there's some great companies out there. Filtered comes to mind and and um, my buddy Jason over there is always feeding me really good information. You know he always talks about how we're moving forward and how we you know collect information in these grow spaces and curing spaces and we've had some great conversations about how they're moving forward to basically sample the air in the space for microbial contaminants. I mean, it takes a collection of petri dish and sending it off to the lab and some interpretation, but I think that's an important thing to consider too. Rob, you had touched on basically having a, a mechanical nose in this space to, you know, tell us, uh, elucidate some of the pathogens as they come about. I think this could also be a tool that could be incorporated even into the shared spaces or the hallway spaces, thinking about the pressures in the curing room and what might be sucked into them and you sort of tracking it back to where those pathogens might be born or starting from in the first place. And also just having something, a system like that in, in the space where you can sample and send it off and get real lab results. It's not exactly uh, the answer to the question that came up here, but I think it's an interesting point uh, we've seen some great companies explore that filter, like I said, sort of comes to mind. But there's a handful of others out there um, that I've talked with as well, pursuing some similar approaches. I think we'll take the opportunity to to wrap it up here. Um, as as mentioned, there's opportunity to reach out uh, for additional questions and specific follow-ups. I think we got to the vast majority of those question topics. Really want to appreciate and uh, thank everybody on the line for joining us. And just a quick plug for our next monthly webinar um, that's planned for a month from now, Thursday, July 2nd, same time, same place. Um, we've been talking quite a bit about these 10 parameters, these 10 cardinal parameters, um, and you can, you can review our first webinar uh, that's available online um, if, you, if you'd missed that one. But um, it, it's sort of this concept of, okay, great, let's do it in the best possible way scientifically and making sure that our plants are really going to thrive and, you know, on and on and on and on. But, well, wait a second, what does that now do to our overall cost of this facility, both CapEx and OpEx, um, which is such a significant factor um, that needs to be considered in this. So um, really excited to, to sort of do a deeper dive uh, in our next one to, to really start to be able to balance cost benefit um, and that relationship together to, to make sure that these decisions that are being made really are, are the best possible decisions uh, for your business and your business model and your profitability. 
Um, so with that, um, really want to thank thank the guys, uh, Jesse and, and Rob, particularly for spending the time on this and doing this deep dive. Uh, it's been great, and we, uh, we're excited to hear from the, from the community uh, with more. And uh, with that, have a great day, and uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.